We're all familiar with the African Serengeti, a vast mosaic of grasslands, shrublands, woodlands and everything in between, heaving with giant herbivores like elephants, wildebeest and giraffes, all being followed by mighty predators including lions, hyenas and painted wolves. But did you know that every continent once had its own equivalent to the Serengeti? We're going to take a look at the South American Serengeti that once was 12,000 years ago when humans established themselves on the continent. The best examples of South American Serengeti that can still be seen today and what South America could look like in the future when more land has been rewilded. Let's take a look at the herbivores that drove the ecosystems of South America before getting to the ferocious predators. There were two species of Gomphothir, Noriomastodon platensis and Cuvierionius hyodon. Gomphotheres are close relatives to the elephants and these 4-5 to five ton giants would have been ecosystem engineers in Pleistocene South America. There were two horse relatives, Equus neogeus, an animal about the size of a plain zebra, and Hippidians aldiasi, a species from an extinct equine lineage. There were at least 10 different giant species in the armadillo family. They were absolutely massive, the biggest of them being the glyptodons, which weighed over 2 tons, twice the weight of a Volkswagen Beetle. Alongside the guanaco and the vicuña, which are still alive today, lived a larger laminoid cousin, Paleolama major, which weighed up to 300 kg or 660 pounds, more than twice the weight of the guanaco, the largest wild laminoid today. Two very unusual animals from lineages completely wiped out today were Xenorhinotherium bahiens and Toxodon platensis. Xenorhinotherium bahiens weighed almost one ton. It is believed it would have looked like a humpless camel, likely sporting a saiga antelope like proboscis. Toxodon platensis was even larger. It likely looked like a hornless rhino and weighed around 1400 kilos or 3100 pounds, similar in weight to Africa's black rhino. In South America today, there are 18 species of deer, from the tiny pudu to the largest native deer, the marsh deer. 12,000 years ago, there were two larger species though, Rhinolaphus brachyceras, which is most closely related to deer in the service genus, like elk or wapiti, and red deer, according to recent studies. And the other was Antifer ultra. Both weighed up to 200 kg, about the weight of Eurasia's red deer. Onto the biggest animal on the continent, there were at least 8 species of huge ground sloth in South America at the time. The smallest of them being about the size of modern day lions and the largest Megatherium weighing up to 5 tons. For perspective, only the largest male Asian elephants get to weights over 5 tons today. Ground sloths weren't just large, Megatherium had claws almost a foot long and could have killed most predators with one swipe. The animals that live in South America today would have lived alongside these extinct giants. The largest remaining are the tapirs, of which there are three species. The largest, aptly named the South American tapir, weighs up to 320 kg or over 700 pounds. There were several species of capybara, today there are two remaining, as well as other large rodent cousins like the agouti and mara. Peccaries, a relative of pigs, are still keystone species today and where they are common, move in herds numbering in their hundreds. The largest bird in South America 12,000 years ago remains the largest, the Great Area, which is an important species on the grasslands it inhabits. Now, what about the predators that hunted the large herbivores on the savannas of South America? The top predator was likely Smilodon populator. Some argued that it was the largest cat that ever lived, though most agree the American lion was larger. Alongside their giant saber-toothed cousin were the jaguar and the puma, the third and fourth largest cats alive today. And of course, some smaller but just as amazing cats like the ocelot and jaguar undi. Of course, where there are cats, there are usually dogs. South America had the dire wolf, which was a little larger than any living canine and had a much larger head and a stronger bite force. Modern day South American canines, like the stocky little pack hunting bush dog and the tallest canine in the world, the maned wolf, would have steered well clear of the dire wolf. All the reptile megafauna that were alive in South America 10,000 BC are still alive today, such as the heaviest snake in the world, the green anaconda. There are six caiman species, the biggest of them, the black caiman, which weighs a whopping 500 kg or 1100 pounds. There are also two huge crocodile species in South America, the Orinoco and American crocodiles. The Orinoco gets the similar sizes as the black caiman, but the American crocodile can get absolutely gigantic, weighing over 1 ton or 2200 pounds. The largest mammalian predator on the continent though was a bear. There were two species of Arctotherium, which means bear beast. The bigger of them, Arctotherium tarragens, weighed up to 400 kg or 880 pounds, which would make it the third largest bear species if we're alive today. Its smaller cousin, Arctotherium wingae, 
weighed up to 150 kg or 330 pounds, similar in size to the only bear that's still in South America today, the spectacled bear. Now that we've seen the amazing animals of the South American Serengeti that was, let's take a look at the best Serengeti style landscapes still found on the continent. The Cerrado and the Pantanal, two incredible landscapes that are connected to one another. The Cerrado is a vast savanna of grasslands, shrublands and forests. It is the most biodiverse savanna in the world and it's absolutely massive, roughly three times the size of Texas or France. The Pantanal is the largest tropical wetland in the world. It too is massive, larger than England for reference. I suppose it is more the South American equivalent to the Okavango Delta. Across these amazing landscapes, there are at least five deer species, including marsh deer and pampas deer, tapirs, two species of peccary, the largest rodent in the world, the capybara, which is about twice the weight of a golden retriever, and many other large rodents, like agoutis and pacas. There are two large grazing tortoise species, the yellow-footed and red-footed tortoises. The great area is common across these habitats, and of course, countless monkey species, including golden lion tamarins and black and gold howler monkeys. There are even many feral horses, known as pantanero, these horses provide benefits like grazing, seed dispersal, and of course, food for predators and scavengers. And it can be said, they're filling the niche of their extinct relatives that once thundered across the grasslands of South America. Then of course, you have the South American weirdos, sloths, armadillos, and anteaters found in these two habitats, including the giant anteater and giant armadillo. But what about the predators? There are several cat species, including ocelots, jaguar undies, and the top predators, pumas and jaguars. There are hoary foxes, maned wolves, and bush dogs, which despite being only the size of Jack Russell Terriers, can take down tapirs, the largest animal on the continent. There are ferocious mustelids, like the tera, whose closest relative is the wolverine, and grisons, which are a bit like a smaller honey badger. And taking a drink in the rivers and marshes is definitely not safe. There are multiple caiman species. In 1996, a survey revealed there were more than 10 million caimans in the Pantanal alone. Yellow anacondas are abundant in the Pantanal, and even green anacondas can be found in some parts of the Cerrado. Then you have the giant river otters, and even jaguars don't mess with them. But not to be forgotten, South America is the land of birds. There are dozens of parrot species, including the highest in Macaw, the longest parrot in the world, and second only in weight to the flightless kakapo of New Zealand. The flamingos of the Pantanal are not flamingos at all, but rose-eat spoonbills, a species pink in colour due to a similar diet to flamingos, and in my opinion, even more beautiful. There are red-legged seriemas, the closest living relative of the largest predatory birds of all time, the terror birds. Amazing raptors can be found across these beautiful landscapes, including great horned owls, monkey-hunting harpy eagles, and king vultures. There is an endless list of amazing animals found in these beautiful joint habitats, and I didn't even get into the amazing amphibian and invertebrate creatures like the Chacoan horned frog and orange banded tarantulas. To make this landscape more impressive, the Cerrado is not only joined to the Pantanal, but also to the Amazon rainforest, Katinga, and the Atlantic forest, forming one huge ecosystem made up of several biomes. But what's difficult to believe is that South America was once even more biodiverse when humans first arrived. South America lost almost all its megafauna. Many studies have shown that when megafauna are removed from an ecosystem, a huge reduction in biodiversity occurs. Here's how. The more megafauna species in a landscape, the greater variety of feeding behaviours, seed dispersing methods and different types of habitat creation. With each species lost though, the plants and invertebrates that depended on that species are lost also, and then a reduction in the species that depended on those plants and invertebrates are lost, and so on. If you remove all megafauna species, plants that rely on large seed dispersing animals either cease to exist or are heavily reduced. Many other plants rely on the dung or urine of large herbivores to thrive, some need to be trampled, or of course the sunlight that's made available when herbivores graze, browse, trample or break as they go through a landscape. So when megafauna are reduced, the plant and invertebrate biodiversity is drastically reduced. Those life forms make up the bottom of the food chain and so biodiversity is reduced at every level above in turn. Something that also happens when large herbivores disappear from a landscape is a reliance on fire to keep it open. Grasslands need herbivores and or fire to survive. When herbivores are wiped out, open landscapes rely fully on fire to remain open and not become closed canopy woodland. 
Without the herbivores, lots of flammable vegetation builds up, eventually causing huge, uncontrollable wildfires across vast stretches of land. This in turn leads to landscapes that only contain fire-tolerant plants and animals, seeing a further reduction in biodiversity. Where herbivores are present, there are of course still wildfires, but they aren't as large or widespread as many areas have been grazed. Fire does have benefits to certain landscapes, and some plants rely on fire for parts of their life cycle. But it is a relatively new phenomenon that there weren't large herbivores on these landscapes to graze and browse, reducing flammable vegetation, which meant other animals were more easily able to escape these smaller, more contained wildfires, and fire-vulnerable plants were able to survive in refuge populations. So now that we know just a little bit of how incredibly important megafauna are, what caused their extinction in the first place? There is some debate. The argument is often between the overchill and overkill hypotheses. Overchill being a climate related extinction event or events, and overkill being overhunting and outcompeting by humans. There is a huge flaw in the overchill hypothesis though. The extinctions occurred at different times on each continent, and those extinctions directly correlate with the arrival of humans. Humans arrived in Australia around 50,000 years ago. Australia lost every species weighing more than 220 pounds, of which there were dozens, between 50,000 and 40,000 years ago. The first significant human settlements were established in North and South America around 13,000 years ago, and over the next 4,000 years, every giant sloth species, every giant armadillo species, all six elephantids, and countless other megafauna species disappeared. The real nail in the coffin is that humans arrived in New Zealand 800 years ago and every megafauna species disappeared. Humans established themselves in Madagascar around 1,300 years ago and there too every megafauna species was wiped out. We know that in New Zealand and Madagascar that it was humans that caused the complete eradication of all megafauna, showing that when humans arrive to a new land, extinctions of megafauna occur. In a time when humans relied on hunting to eat, it wouldn't have taken long for a species naive to human predation to disappear. And we can even see that today, in a time of wildlife conservation, population surveys, and widespread agriculture to produce our food, that when hunting pressure is put on an animal, it doesn't take long for them to disappear from a landscape. Because we know now the importance of megafauna, many ecologists have lobbied to reintroduce megafauna to ecosystems that once had them. In South America, Brazilian ecologist Mauro Galetti has been the biggest advocate of this. So what animals could be introduced to South America to increase ecosystem function and biodiversity? Before discussing these, I'd like to add that any animal introduction should only ever be done after extensive research and trials, and the following suggestions are only discussion points. The animal I most often see touted for introduction to South America is the elephant. As there were two elephantids in South America when humans were there first, and we know the importance of elephantids in their ecosystems, many have suggested this. Sadly, there are no closely related proxies for the many giant sloth species, but given their similarity in size and known seed dispersing abilities, elephants could be the best proxy for those too. Another possible introduction would be a rhinoceros species to fill the niche of Toxodon platensis. Though not closely related, morphologically they are very similar, and it is believed that rhinos are amongst their closest living relatives today. Rhinos, like elephants, also have the following benefit. Their populations are regulated by their slow reproduction rates and by the amount of food and space available to them. Unlike smaller animals, predation doesn't really impact their behavior or population growth. There are many feral horse herds in South America, some of which have lived wild for centuries, and these are preyed upon by jaguars and pumas. Restoring a wildlife interaction lasted the continent for thousands of years since the South American horses went extinct. Many do already see these feral horses as an important part of the South American landscape, but should they be fully welcomed as a proxy for their extinct relatives? Of course, South America lost many predators since humans arrived, including bears, dire wolves, and smilodon but it still has some top predators like the puma and jaguar, both of which are capable predators of large animals, and protection of those amazing predators and allowing them to recolonize their former range is much more important than any introduction I could suggest. Many will likely point to the damage being done by hippos in the Amazon when suggestions like rhino and elephant introductions are being made, but unlike rhinos, elephants or horses, there has never been a hippo equivalent in South America, and as such, the ecosystem isn't adapted to the huge disturbance caused by hippos. Hippos in Africa are an amazing ecosystem engineer that shaped the rivers they inhabit, and the plants and animals are adapted to the vast amounts of fertilizing dung they produce, but that isn't the case in the Amazon. Some have said they do provide some benefit in Colombia, but I haven't seen any evidence to prove that point today. 
Though these suggestions remain unlikely for now and should only ever be done after trials and research, can you imagine a South America where elephant had shaped the forests and grasslands once more? Where a stallion scares off a puma to the howls and screeches of onlooking monkeys? Where rhinos and tapirs cool off in waters thick with caimans and rose-eat spoonbills? Can you imagine the South American Serengeti? Are there any animals you think could increase biodiversity in South America? Or should we just protect what still remains? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Thank you, as always, for watching.